Around midnight, June 30th, 1984, a cruise ship, Sundancer, struck the rocks in Seymour Narrows and started taking on water. We had just been out patrolling uh, in the evening, just kind of keeping an eye on things, making sure people had their lights on and stuff as it got dark. And we had just got home and uh, just kind of was heading off to bed and, and I got a call that the Sundancer had hit the rocks in Seymour Narrows and to come back in. Well, Menzies Bay is, 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 a, is a bay just off Seymour Narrows where it's, you know, the water's calmer and that's why it's quite shallow and flat in there. It's a booming ground actually for log, log booms. And so they were just idling around in there while they were trying to decide how much damage they had and, 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 and what to do, basically. We pulled alongside as, as they were heading for, for the Duncan Bay dock and, and we passed our pumps across to them. Amazingly, there was myself and, and, and the other deckhand, and, and uh, if I tried to lift that thing now, there's no way I could lift that thing. It, adrenaline was really working at the time. So. Just happened to have my camera on board at that, at that time, and I wasn't, that, I wasn't the key person there, so, so I, I had time to, and I had, I had good sensitive film on my camera back in the days of film cameras, and, and, uh, so, and again, because it was at the mill, there was a lot of, lot of light, so it, that helped my pictures a lot. But the pictures were, were very valuable as evidence so you know it was it was good for the for the mill and their lawsuit and and, and the cruise line to see what happened because nobody else had a camera at the time so there was a point where the the ship was unable to to maintain their power and so all their lights went out and and there was there was sort of that moment where <laughs> the lights went out and everybody kind of stopped and said, you know, what, what's going on? And then they managed to bring the lights back on for a while. The emergency power came back on, which really helped. But yeah, it was that moment when all the lights went out and the, the pumps, their own pumps stopped. And it got kind of quiet. And everybody kind of took a breath and wondered what was going on. But uh, so once the lights came back on, we carried on. It was, it, I remember my hair standing on end at that time. It was just, yeah, when I had hair. So once the Sundancer was, was secure the dock, I went ashore to assist with, with the evacuation, basically, and to, went on board the boat to assess what was happening. It was interesting, because it's a ferry as well, so it had, it had cars on it, and the cars were starting to fall off, off to one side, and uh, you could see the water coming up the stairwells. Sundancer came in on its own power from, from Menzies Bay, uh, we already had about a 15 degree list on it, but they came along, brought it up alongside the dock, rammed the, the bow up into the, the mud, basically, uh, and then uh, uh, got it tied up. We brought the stern lines into here. Then the crew from the pulp mill brought a, a gangway down, a wooden gangway down, and they were able to put it across to the gun port door, one of the lower door, passenger doors on the ship. And that's where the majority of the passengers were able to get off pretty, pretty easily, pretty safely. They disembarked, took off their life jackets, threw them in a big pile, and there was waiting school buses for them, so they um, took them off into town to be mustered, mustered in town. Generally, it was pretty, pretty calm for the most part, but uh, uh, I mean, it's a frightening experience and, and something that, that I'm sure nobody had ever experienced before. So uh, yeah, there was a lot of people who were very grateful to get down the, those ladders and onto the dock and got hugged and kissed a few times. So. <laughs> So after the gangway was too stretched and, and couldn't, couldn't span the distance between the dock and the, and the ship anymore, it fell in the water. Fortunately, there was nobody on it at the time. Um, so they decided to bring the rope ladders down from, from the lifeboat deck, bring them down, attach them to the bull rails on, on the dock, and people came down the rope ladders, which was working quite well. But around the stern, there was one rope ladder that didn't go anywhere. It was because it was beyond the, the dock. So unfortunately, from some misdirection or whatever, some people came, were coming down that ladder. There was people coming down behind them. So once they got to the bottom, realized they couldn't go any further, the people that were coming down were stepping on their fingers and that. So they had no choice but to let go and, and, and drop in the water. But fortunately, there was one of our Zodiacs was on hand to pick them up at the time. So nobody spent too much time in the water. It was a pretty dramatic 
sight to see the people dropping in the water. I mean, I knew that they were going to be picked up fairly quickly, but it's still uh, not something we'd like to have happen. Uh, as the ship was listing over, as it was singing, it was listing more and more. So the hull was pushing against the, the pilings, these pilings, and you could feel them snapping and groaning and that. And, and uh, then eventually, fortunately, once everybody was off the dock, it just couldn't hold anymore and the dock collapsed. Yeah, fortunately, there was, um, there was nobody injured. There was, I understand there was a few people went to the hospital with chest pains. You have to remember that the passengers on a, on a cruise ship to Alaska generally are older, so, so there was some chest pains in that, but uh, there was nobody hurt. Uh, and there was, no, there was no real incidents, medical incidents from it, so it was very fortunate. We, we stayed around for, for a good part of the day uh, because there was a pollution concern. We made sure that, that, that uh, oil booms were deployed because there was quite a bit of oil came out of it as it sunk. I'm just very impressed with how well everything went off as far as in, in, in all, all aspects that, that the, the town had a phenomenal emergency plan in place and uh, they were able to handle uh, 800 people in a small town on a, on a, at midnight or you know early, small hours of the morning on a July long weekend and uh, they were able to have a place to, to, to take them uh, that within I believe six hours of the incident that everybody every single person was accounted for and uh, was provided with comfort coffee blankets things like that you know, all aspects were really well handled and the town deserves a lot of credit. Some of the passengers came back to Campbell River on the anniversary and uh, the, the cruise line donated money for, for fireworks because this all happened on, on the July 1st weekend. So they, they donated uh, money for the town to have a fireworks display. I mean, in my 32-year career, it, pro it probably is one of the most significant incidents, it's simply the, the, the magnitude of it, the fact that there were so many people involved. Um, well, this, this happened 38 years ago, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's fading from, from memory, and, and I am the last person uh, from that crew that's still alive, so yeah, I'm the last one to tell a story, I guess.
the marine environment here is, is unique with the way the tide runs. It can be more like a river environment. Cape Mudge being right down here, a predominant wind direction is southeast in the wintertime. So when you've got a strong flood tide opposing a southeast wind, uh, you get really tough weather conditions down there causing problems for anybody. So we typically do about 150 search and rescue calls uh, on average each year out of this station and um, the majority of them are concentrated off of Cape Mudge. The station here is unique due to the like the tidal movement and everything here. Each station is is different based on the geographic area that you operate in. So out here in Discovery Passage, the tide can run eight knots. Um, so even if your boat is stopped up, you're not stationary. So you have to pay extra close attention to where you are, where you are, and what you're doing. I think life at the station here is comparable to other stations. Um, this one is less remote, so the crew can, you know, get in the truck and go to town and um, purchase things the station needs uh, for operation, whereas other sites um, are very remote, so equipment needs to be brought in. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be based out of Campbell River. I live in town, so uh, it's a real bonus to, to work out of town as well. It can be a pretty cool job. Yeah, these boats are really neat and uh, people seem to stop and, and notice the vessel and take interest in it. And it's nice to see how interested people are um, in these boats and, and, and what we do. We have people approach us all the time and it, those interactions are, are neat. Typically, uh, it would be used in poor weather, longer duration calls, uh, if you want to stay warmer and dry. I prefer to drive from the open bridge up top. I can see better from up there. Um, I have better situational awareness up top there. I like the fresh air. It helps reduce my seasickness. Uh, we've got all of our navigational equipment down here. Um, we've got chart blotters, radars, radios, depth sounders. Uh, throttles. Um, one unique thing down here is there's no helm. You just see these jog steering levers um, on both sides. So you can drive from both chairs here, starboard and port. Everything I can do down here, I can do up top and vice versa. We just did a long transit uh, a few days ago, actually, and it was um, rainy. Um, so we were down here for a number of hours in order to stay dry. We just brought this vessel up from Victoria to replace our normal vessel. Once a year, we have a scheduled refit that we, we um, swap vessels out for for about a month. This is sort of our primary storage area where we keep all of our equipment. We've got um, some firefighting equipment on board. Um, primarily, it's all of our first aid equipment that we use. Um, so we've got stretcher packs and such here, um, blankets, uh, this device we can uh, put the stretcher on to um, move patients over rough terrain. You see the, the heavy duty tire here, um, some life jackets, uh, additional stretchers over here, um, and then smaller equipment in the totes here. So we do have a, a line throwing gun here if we can't get in close enough to uh, a disabled vessel to pass them a line, we can do it via this um, line throwing device. Use this um, stretcher pack here often to transport patients. It's uh, heavy duty, you can slide it across the decks or rough terrain. We've got some life jackets here and the yellow bag there is a uh, personnel recovery net we can hang off the side of the boat to uh, recover people in the water. The first aid equipment we use regularly, so the, the crew will be in and out of here um, grabbing equipment quite regularly. We work a two-week shift, so they would be down here a few times a shift, typically. Yeah, we're here in the survivor's compartment. This is a commonly used space to take on passengers and patients. 
and to transit through to get to other areas of the vessel. One of the main ways we use the space is to bring patients um, on board the vessel uh, and transport them to the hospital. So we drop this bench here and uh, mount some brackets here and here. And then we can slide our stretcher right in through the exterior hatch onto the bracket system and secure the patients for transport. Yeah. yeah. Comfortably, we can transport uh, two patients uh, in this space and we can seat five passengers on the benches in here. We'll clip in anytime we're out uh, in heavy weather and, and have to move around the boat. Um, we don't come up to the foredeck often, so if we, if we need to, we will clip into the D-rings with our safety harnesses when moving about the vessel. So we've got well decks on each side of the vessel. We can raise these grates up if we need to recover anybody out of the water or get off the vessel onto a low dock. These grates can be lifted up. And we've got uh, more of the uh, D-rings we can clip into as we're moving about the vessel in heavy weather. There's more of the D-rings down in the well. Um, they'll be clipped in so they can reach over. And uh, we have a personnel recovery net that we can use to roll the person on board, or we can just pull them in if possible. This is where we spend most of our time. We can uh, perform all the same navigation functions up top here as we can down in the enclosed bridge. Um, I like being up here better because there's no um, view obstructions. So I've got a full 360 degrees um, and I prefer being in the fresh air when possible. We usually are all four uh, up here at the same time. And that way everybody's able to keep an eye out for logs and vessels. So we've got sort of more of a traditional helm up top here. Uh, we've got the same navigation computer, radar, depth sounders, VHF radios, the gyro compass heading there, as well as the magnetic compass and the um, engine room monitoring panels here as well. We do look at navigational aids when, when they go down. Uh, environmental response calls seem to be keeping us quite busy as well. So our primary job here is search and rescue. But uh, when we're not doing that, there's lots of other tasks that keep us busy day to day. So when a boat sinks, um, now we're concerned about the uh, impact, uh, the pollution impact. And so environmental response is to try to mitigate uh, the damage to the environment um, due to the release of fuels from these vessels. We'll typically go in and boom the vessel off to try to contain uh, the spill. Um, and then if there's enough uh, product in the water, we'll attempt to recover it. Uh, we'll service navigational aids or troubleshoot them if they, if they go down. Um, we'll get tasked to go out and have a look and see why they're not functioning as they should. And if we can repair them, we will. So I started on the larger vessels for a number of years. Um, and they are longer shifts, they're a month on, month off uh, shift system, and you work a 12 hour day uh, at sea. You got to see a lot of the coast that way and uh, accumulate a lot of sea time as well, um, which goes towards uh, certificates of competency if you decide to go that route. So I really enjoyed my time at sea. It was different having not had any experience working on the water to now be working on a large ship uh, offshore. Was a, was a different experience for me, for sure. And it, it did take some getting used to, yeah. So a lifeboat station is, is this operation here and it's primarily search and rescue. Um, so it's a two week on, two week off shift cycle and um, you're on call for that whole duration. So any after hour call outs, you get, you get paged and, and you go out and respond. So we've got uh, two deckhands, an engineer and a captain uh, at each station. For our two week on cycle, there's four of us here. And when we go off for two weeks at a time, the other crew of four will come on and perform the same functions. So I'm the captain and I'm responsible for the operation of the station. Um, the engineer will maintain the vessel and troubleshoot any issues that come up mechanically with the vessel and with the station and the staff accommodation. 
and the deckhands are they'll do basically everything um, they'll help me they'll help the engineer when we are doing calls they're sort of the primary um, tool uh, they'll get off the boat and 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 deal with whatever's happening um, they're rescue specialists as well so they've got first aid training um, and uh, to, they operate the uh, the fast rescue craft as well Uh, we'll get a report from uh, or a tasking from Rescue Coordination Centre out of Victoria. They'll give us the information that they have and then we'll make it a, a decision at that point as to which vessel we, we feel is most suitable to respond to the, to the scenario. Um, so a lot of times we'll bring both vessels with us um, so that we have uh, all the tools in our toolbox and in, in order to do the best job that we can. Uh, we do a lot of medevacs, so people that get injured off of boats or out of remote areas ashore. So we'll we'll go in and, and recover them and transport them back to town so they can get up to the hospital. So that's a big part of what we do here. We'll tow a lot of disabled vessels if they're um, if it's sort of a higher risk situation, like the weather's bad or they're getting close to shore or something like that. We'll we'll go out. We do a lot of towing from from this boat. Um, and we do a lot of searches as well for boaters that are overdue, um, so it, it, it varies. Um, you never know what you're going to get any given day. I think in order to do this job, you have to be really good at improvising and, and problem solving and expect the unexpected. You'll get information and you'll arrive on scene and it can, it can be really different because the person in distress didn't relay their situation effectively. So uh, I think uh, just generally to expect the unexpected and, and not come to any conclusions uh, until you've arrived and confirmed what exactly it is you're dealing with is, is a big part of it. It can be challenging. I think when you've got a good, strong group that you're working with, it's, uh, it's made a lot easier. I'm really fortunate I've got a good group of people working here. It is a lot of pressure um, in the difficult scenarios. You know, I'm responsible for their safety and mine, and, and that's a big responsibility, and there is, there is a lot of pressure there, for sure. That's the most important part of the job, is getting everybody back home. We deal with traumatic events from time to time, and uh, it's difficult um, witnessing that stuff. And, and again, it kind of comes back to protecting the crew and, and uh, you know, making sure they're okay with those exposures. And there's a support system in place um, in the Coast Guard that we can uh, initiate to help people through these traumatic events that we sometimes face. Yeah, we can access counseling if we need to. Uh, that's a really valuable tool to use, um, I find personally. Um, and then there's also uh, more of a peer uh, uh, critical incident stress team that will come and help out with debriefings and such as needed. Yeah, and it affects everybody differently. Me personally, sometimes you, you'll think it hasn't impacted you and then you'll realize in the future that maybe it has, you're still thinking about it and um, you know, maybe feeling tired or burnt out. Um, so it's nice to talk about it. It can be a dangerous job when the weather conditions are up and it's middle of the night um, and you're tasked to deal with a difficult situation. Um, but uh, again, it's our responsibility to slow down and um, do what we can do and it's really nice when we can contribute to a positive outcome and it can be difficult when things don't turn out the way we'd like them. Depending on the weather conditions, we may not be able to get to a vessel 
Um, we may not be able to locate um, an individual or a vessel depending on the weather conditions. Um, and certain weather conditions are uh, outside of the capabilities of the crew and the vessel. So um, we have to weigh all of that before departing. No, I've always managed to respond. The outcome isn't always what we want it to be, um, but I've always managed to respond. We always, we always try. <laughs>